head back into the world of Windows handhelds, and I am so excited to start the new year with one of my most anticipated devices and one that I've been personally waiting for since the days of the GPD Win 2. In many ways, GPD's latest, the Win Mini, is the spiritual successor to the original GPD Win and Win 2. This is a form factor that I have been hoping that GPD would revisit, and that time has finally arrived. This is a seriously impressive piece of kit that somehow manages to pack AMD's Ryzen 7840U into one of the smallest footprints that have been seen with the specific chipset. We're going to take a deep dive into one of GPD's most impressive devices to date and examine everything it has to offer, including PC gaming, emulation, a teardown, and a lot more. Please join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, as we explore just how mighty Mini can be. Let's roll out the specs first and learn more about the GBD Win Mini, which comes equipped with a 7 inch 169 120Hz LTPS touchscreen display at a resolution of 1920 by 1080, with a 314 ppi and 500 nits of brightness. It is available in two different configurations powered by the AMD Ryzen 7640U or the 7840U, both based on the Phoenix Zen 4 architecture and a 4 nanometer fab process. The unit that I have been provided with is the 7840U version. For the GPU, the 7040U model is equipped with the Radeon 780M clocked at 2.7GHz with 12 CUs and 768 shader units. The 7640U model is equipped with the Radeon 760M clocked at 2.6GHz with 8 CUs and 512 shader units. Both models come equipped with LP DDR5 RAM with options ranging from 16GB all the way up to 64GB. In addition, both models use the M.2 NVMe 2230 storage with configurations starting from 512GB up to 2TB. Storage is expandable via the micro SD slot. The Win Mini features a USB 4.0 Type-C, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C, a 3.5mm headphone port, and an Oculink port which supports GPD's own G1 mobile GPU. It includes built-in Wi-Fi 6 802.11ax support with Bluetooth 5.2. The Win Mini is powered by a 44.24 watt-hour battery, which GPD claims provides three hours for heavy use, about six to eight hours of moderate use, and 14 hours for light use. We will be exploring battery life a little bit later on in this video. The Win Mini does ship with Windows 11 Home out of the box. It is available now for purchase and starts at $750 US dollars for the base 7640U model and scales up in price based on the various configurations, which goes all the way up to $1200 US dollars for the max configuration featuring the 7840U, 64GB of RAM, and 2TB of storage. I will have their AliExpress page linked down in the description so you can check out the various options available. There is also an optional grip attachment and 4G LTE module available for the Win Mini. Finally, I'd like to thank GPD for sending me the Win Mini for the purpose of this review, and as I always require, this video was not reviewed prior to publishing. It's now time for our unboxing, and this package should be a familiar sight for anyone that has owned prior GPD products as the packaging is quite similar. I also have the grip attachment here, which we will be checking out as well. Let's take a look around the box, and it's a very clean and minimal package with just the GPD and Win Mini branding. There's a small sticker on one side which notes the version of the Win Mini, which in this case is the 7840U with the 32GB of RAM and 2TB of storage. It's time to get the top cover off and then reveal what's inside. First thing we are greeted with is the GPD logo and what appears to be an insert with some documents. Let's get the flap open and then check out what GPD has provided in this, which looks to be the fairly standard user manual. This does provide nice detailed information about the unit itself, and it's well worth looking through. For example, the keyboard function keys are fully detailed here. Okay, let's put this aside and continue to dive into things here. Of course, we have the Win Mini front and center in its plastic back. Let's go ahead and grab it out, and I have to say, I'm really surprised by how light it is. I was expecting it to be heavier for some reason, but it does feel nice in terms of its weight so far. And sorry to be a tease, but let's put the Win Mini aside briefly so we can further examine the rest of the package contents. Let's first check out the smallest item in here, which is the included USB Type-C to USB-A adapter. The Win Mini does not have a full-size USB-A port on the device itself, so this included adapter is nice to have. 
Next we have the USB Type-C to Type-C cable, which is pretty substantial feeling and a decent length. Finally, we have the beefy power block. This is a 65 watt adapter, which does support power delivery. And that is everything that is included in the box for the Win Mini. So let's get back to the main attraction now and reveal the Win Mini. Slowly taking out of its protective bag, and we get our first look at the beautiful matte finish here with the GPD logo centered on the top of the show. I really like the way this looks and feels so far, and I can't help but seriously be impressed that there's a 7840U crammed into this tiny shell. This is seriously a nice piece of kit, and I can't wait to dive further into this one. This is the perfect time to take a tour around the Win Mini and get familiar with all of its features. It's no secret that this is a clamshell device, which opens up to reveal a mini keyboard and full gaming controls. This is the little brother to the Win Max 2 and the spiritual successor to the Win 2 from many years ago. I really love this form factor for a Windows handheld and I can't overstate how excited I am that we finally have the follow-up to the design of the Win 2. Let's start as usual with the right side and take a closer look at the right shoulder button and trigger. The triggers here are using hull-based sensors. I'm pretty impressed by the range of movement available here given the size constraints. The movement feels very smooth without any issues or roughness. The R1 button here is designed to be pressed in from the outer portion on the right, and so when pressing down on it towards the center, you will notice that it doesn't actually press down evenly across, since again, these are designed to be pressed from the outside. It's not a huge issue for me, as when you hold the device in your hands, these are still easy to access and press down, lining up with your fingers. The R1 button makes a very subtle and light clicky sound, which isn't very audible. Moving along, we have the micro SD slot for storage expansion, as well as the OcuLink port for an external graphics solution such as GPD's own G1. Next to that, we have the 3.5mm headset port, a switch for mouse or gamepad mode, which was usually on the front like on the Wimax 2, and two USB Type-C ports, one of which supports USB 4.0, and the other being a USB 3.2 Gen 2. In between the USB-C ports, we have the charging indicator light, and below these, we have the exhaust vent for the active cooling. Finally, we have the reset button at the end of this row. Let's now check out how the left shoulder button and trigger feel here. Things feel very similar to the right side, and again, the shoulder button here is similar in function to the right one, and the same movement and travel for that left trigger. Now moving along the left side of the mini, we have this really nice texture, and it doesn't necessarily make it easier to hold, but it does give the device an interesting look. Coming down to the front of the device, we have the small indent in the top part of the shell to make it easier to open up. And on the right side of the front here, we have a spot to place a lanyard or something similar to it. Finally, on the right side, we have the same texturing as seen on the left. Let's now take a look at the bottom of the mini, and the most prominent thing here is the large vent, and peeking through this is the fan for active cooling. This is going to be a very critical component to the cooling given the size constraints present here. We have some rubber feet present at the bottom front, and then some text. We do have some visible screws here, which we will investigate a little bit more during the teardown portion. So let's flip this thing around and take a look at the mini with the lid opened up. First thing I will comment on is the very tight hinge, which feels very solid. Let me also show the lid fully open back at a different angle so you can see how far back this can go. It does not sit fully flush, but does go a decent amount back. The hinge is very smooth and feels very strong with good resistance. And even going as far as shaking the wind mini a bit, and the display is staying put, which by the way, as I mentioned earlier, is a 7-inch 1080p LTPS 69 panel with a 120Hz refresh rate. Let's now get really close up with the built-in controls and keyboard. First, let's check out the built-in hall-based analog stick, which is smaller in size like a switch stick. This does sit flush with the front here as expected given the need to accommodate the clamshell design. The D-pad is at this point a standard for GBD, and much like many of their recent handhelds, is using a Vita-inspired D-pad. It has a very subtle clickiness, but unlike the Vita D-pad, the one GPD uses here does have a bit less movement overall. It doesn't quite have as defined of a pivot as I usually like to see, but I am still a fan of this D-pad, and am pretty accustomed to it given its presence on multitudes of GPD devices like the Win 4 and Win Max 2. Below the analog stick and D-pad, we have the left front-firing stereo speaker, and then the select, menu, and programmable L4 button. These have a matte texture to them with a soft press and short travel, and are very quiet. And of course below that, one of the biggest distinguishing features of the Win Mini, which is its compact keyboard. These feel very similar to the buttons above and have a soft press, short travel, and matte texture. We will definitely be talking about this more. Another nice inclusion here is the touchpad at the center, which supports up to four fingers simultaneously for gestures. Besides the trackpad, we have the four face buttons in the A, B, X, Y, Xbox style setup, 
and as usual, GPD has included markings for the PlayStation style setup in a smaller font. These have a fairly short travel and a very light clickiness to them that again is mimicking the PlayStation Vita. Next to the face buttons, we have the right analog stick, and here is a look at the stick from the side to see how it sits in the unit. Finally, below that, we have the R4 and start buttons and the right side front firing stereo speakers. It's now time to set this down and turn it on for the first time and take a look at the initial setup process, as well as take a tour of Windows 11 and any included GPD software. Welcome to your desktop in Windows 11, and this is a fairly common site for GPD devices with a pretty clean install of Windows 11 outside of a few useful GPD programs and the Steam setup. Beyond that, expect the usual Microsoft loaded software that I'd recommend removing if you have no use for. So the first thing we will check out is the Motion Assistant tool, which is again a standard piece of software on GPD devices. This might not be the fanciest piece of software, however it is very useful and one that is simple to use and works pretty well. The main thing that most will be interested in is the TDP adjustments. You can set TDP based on situations such as on AC or DC power. You can unify these settings so that it's the same regardless of scenario. Additionally, you can set custom TDPs or use the preset ones to click on the fly and make the TDP adjustments. There's lots of other settings here, including GPU adjustments, fan adjustments, and more. We also have the ability to enable gyro input, and this is pretty useful for certain emulators. The hockey sections allow you to set certain commands to an input of your choice. This has been useful for me when doing in-game testing since I can adjust TDP on the fly without needing to pull up the motion assistant software. Finally, in the advanced tab, we have a few more settings such as having motion assistant start automatically with Windows. Let's now check out the included wind control software by GPD. This is another simple piece of software that allows you to program the L4 and R4 buttons as well as customize the inputs when toggled in mouse mode. For example, here you can see that the analog stick is mapped to simulate WASD. And for one last thing worth mentioning here is the included GPD PDF, which has a nice section on the Win Mini and explains some additional functionality. For first time owners, I recommend quickly going through this section to get a better understanding of some of the key features such as the keyboard backlight. Now, one thing I always recommend doing is to join the GPD Discord, where you can get a lot of useful information as well as help from great users over there. The big thing is to check out the pins on the Win Mini channel, and you will find some useful things like tips to adjust your EQ settings for better sound quality, drivers, BIOS updates, and more. In fact, the pinned lay-in dock is something that I 3D printed for my Win Mini and will be seen a few times in this video. So let's talk about the build quality here of the Win Mini. And there's no doubt that when you first hold the Win Mini in your hands, it is very premium feeling. The materials used here, the finishing, and just the size of the device alone really left me feeling impressed. Most importantly, the quality of the engineering here is apparent from the tight hinge right down to the tight finish. I don't have anything rattling around here and everything works as expected. Now one thing I did notice with the Win Mini are the fingerprints on the shell and inside the shell. It does appear that despite the finishing feeling premium, after a bit of handling it does need to be wiped down a bit to keep it looking its best. Another minor complaint are the rubber feet on the bottom. I do wish that GPD had an additional set in the back below the triggers instead of the small plastic feet present there. The Win Mini does slide around when pushing it ever so slightly. It's not the biggest issue, but it is worth mentioning. Finally, despite the hinge feeling very solid, we really won't know until more time has passed how well it will hold up, and so it's another point worth mentioning here in this section, as clamshells are always a tricky thing because of the hinges. I mentioned earlier that GPD has used a 7-inch 16.9 120Hz LTPS display with a resolution of 1920 by 1080 which gives us a decent pixel density. The panel does look really great in person, and viewing angles are excellent from top down or from left to right and vice versa. It's also a display that gets quite bright and GPD does claim 500 nits of brightness with this panel and it also scales down quite well for dark light situations. Now, the panel is capable of a 120Hz refresh rate, and I do wish it had variable refresh rate support, but for older or lighter games, the ability to lock at 120Hz is a welcome addition. On the audio side, we have front firing speakers that get very loud while maintaining their clarity. I was worried a bit about the placement of the stereo speakers since they are right below the analog sticks on both sides. I noticed that when gaming, given the way I hold the Win Mini, reaching for the analog sticks, there is still a gap present beneath my thumbs, so it doesn't obstruct the speaker cutouts. And when reaching in for the D-pad and face buttons, my thumb is completely out of the way and again doesn't block or distort the speakers.
So let's talk about the D-pad here, which as I mentioned is meant to look like a Vita D-pad. However, I've talked about the GPD D-pad before, and despite it looking very much like a Vita D-pad, it does feel quite different. A Vita D-pad has a lot more movement with a much more defined pivot, whereas the D-pad on the Wii Mini is a bit more stiff with less movement and pivot. However, that doesn't mean it's not a good D-pad, as when we go in-game, it's very accurate and even in my usual testing of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, I'm having no issues moving around and pulling off combos of various types in succession. Now, GPD did send along with the Win Mini their official grip attachment. This is an interesting design, as the Win Mini was designed with the intention of supporting this attachment from the beginning. On the Win Mini, you will notice that it has empty spots for additional screws, which is where the grip attachment comes into play. In the package, GPD includes additional screws as well as a screwdriver to install the grip. You do need to remove some of the pre-installed screws to make room for the longer screws needed for the grip attachment. It's not an overly complicated process, but once it's been installed, the grips really provide an additional level of comfort that really makes the Win Mini great to hold. While I applaud GPD for this great idea and the benefits of improved comfort, I do think it's in a weird position since most will probably leave it installed given that it's not just something that snaps on. I think that would have been a better solution since you can quickly decide whether you want the most portability of the clamshell design or prefer some additional comfort with a grip. The problem is that you will always need a screwdriver on hand to be able to remove or attach the grip. Personally, I have found the Win Mini pretty comfortable on its own without the grip attachment, but it is nice that GPD does provide the option. So the Win Mini has quite a few defining elements, including its clamshell, but once you open the lid, you are greeted by a keyboard and trackpad. This is a fairly unusual thing to see on most Windows-based handhelds, and really the only other devices that come to mind are GPD's own WinMax 2 and Win 4, with a more recent competitor from Ioneo. Personally, I find that Windows handhelds really need keyboard input, whether it is a physical or virtual one, but for many, having that tactile physical element is an essential thing. The keyboard here is definitely a key feature of the Win Mini, which manages to be larger than the one present on the Win 4, and therefore a little bit easier to use. I found that the keyboard was also easier to thumb type on when holding it normally as a handheld device for gaming. In fact, extending both of my thumbs into the center, I can effectively reach the entirety of the keyboard. Whereas on the Win 4, I was not able to do this because of the controls on each side. Now the reality is that you will not be sitting down and typing up pages of text with this device, and it's really not meant for that. Its best use case is dealing with the need for short keyboard inputs when navigating windows, and for that it's quite handy to have. It's great having the physical keyboard there for shortcuts as well. This keyboard is also backlit and supports two different levels of brightness as well as the ability to turn it off completely. Now the trackpad on the other hand for me personally is something that I rarely use as I find it's just easier to use the available touchscreen for most of the navigation. Now something to keep in mind is that GPD managed to include a keyboard, trackpad, and gaming controls in a compact space that manages to be smaller than nearly all the other 7840U devices on the market. And speaking of size, let's round up a few other Windows handhelds to get a good sense of where the Win Mini stands in terms of size and weight. You will see on screen that I have the Win Mini joined by the ASUS ROG Ally, AYN Loki Mini Pro, and GPD's own Win 4. Starting out with the Win Mini, which comes in at 530 grams or about 1 pound 3 ounces. Here is the Win 4, another Windows handheld from GPD with a built-in physical keyboard. The Win 4 weighs in at a little over 1 pound 5 ounces or 609 grams. Next, we have the AYN Loki Mini Pro, a rarity at this point, but a fairly compact Windows handheld which weighs in at 573 grams or a little over 1 pound 4 ounces. And finally, the big name OEM Windows handheld with the ASUS ROG Ally weighing in at 1 pound 5.5 ounces or 612 grams. The weigh-in paints a very interesting picture, with the Win Mini coming in as the lightest handheld here out of this group. This is pretty impressive to see as the GPD still manages to pack in a physical keyboard unlike the Loki or ROG Ally. Not only that, but the Win Mini still manages to pack in a 7 inch screen like the Ally. Now let's size these handhelds up, and I think this is another very impressive area for the Win Mini, which maintains a very compact footprint. Even compared to an already fairly compact Windows handheld GPD's Win 4, the Win Mini somehow manages to come in less wide than it, albeit slightly taller, and even then, it's not much taller than the Win 4. Not only that, the Win Mini and Win 4 share very similar thickness, but the Win Mini has the larger keyboard and screen, even though they do share that similar thickness. 
Let's now bring in the ROG Ally, which is a much larger handheld, especially in terms of its width. The Ally and the Win Mini both share the same screen size at 7 inches, with the Win Mini supporting 120Hz, but the Ally does have a 120Hz variable refresh display. The Win Mini essentially is the size of the display and bezel area of the ROG Ally. Even in terms of thickness, the Win Mini somehow is only slightly thicker than what we are seeing here with the ROG Ally. Finally, one last Windows handheld, the Loki Mini Pro, which is definitely smaller than something like the ROG Ally, but still is a bit wider than the Win Mini. The Loki Mini Pro also has a 6-inch screen, which is smaller than the one on the Win Mini. However, the Win Mini is a little bit taller than the Loki Mini Pro. And much like other Windows handhelds, the Win Mini is still very close in terms of thickness. Now let's get some hard numbers with the Win Mini measuring in at 26.2mm, the Win 4 measuring in at 28.5mm, the ROG Ally coming in at 21mm, and finally the Loki Mini Pro, which measures in at 22.6mm. And so we can see that the Win Mini, while not the thinnest of the group here, still manages to be thinner than the Win 4 and is only a few millimeters off from the Loki Mini Pro and ROG Ally. One last thing to measure here is the Win Mini itself. And so let's check out the diameter of the analog stick caps, which are definitely on the smaller side, coming in at about 14.5 millimeters. The face buttons are also pretty small here, which measure in at under 7 millimeters. Now compared to the Win 4, which actually had smaller face buttons coming in at just a little over 6 millimeters, I'm glad that the face buttons are slightly larger on the Win Mini. And the same can be said for the Win 4's analog stick cap, which is also smaller at about 13.5 millimeters. Of course, compared to something like the ROG Ally, which has almost standard sized face buttons at 10mm and a much larger analog stick cap. For fun, I wanted to do one last comparison and bring in everyone's favorite clamshell handheld, the DS and 3DS. I have a Nintendo DSi XL and a 2DS XL here for this comparison, and I think this best highlights just how compact the Win Mini really is compared to something like the DS and 3DS. The Win Mini is no doubt an impressive piece of technology with the 7840U being present in such a small space and form factor. I think GPD did an amazing job from an engineering point of view with the Win Mini. And it's now time to take a look at just how GPD pulled this off with our Mini Teardown. And I say Mini because the goal of this teardown is to get down to the point that we are able to access the battery for removal and swap out the NVMe drive in case someone wanted to upgrade to a larger capacity drive. We will examine some other things along the way, but for most, those are the key serviceability points that many will most likely make with their device in the future. The bottom shell is held into place with standard Phillips screws. There are five on the bottom, one of which is covered by the GPD warranty sticker. I definitely have mixed feelings about this, as potentially changing out something as simple as the SSD drive will require breaking the seal of that sticker. At the back of the Mini, there are three additional screws that need to be removed as well for a total of eight screws holding the bottom shell into place. Let's go ahead and quickly remove the three screws here, and then move to the bottom plate where we can remove the additional five screws. With all of the screws removed, the bottom plate comes off very easily. Now be careful, there is a cable connected to the plate which is for the vibration motors, so don't pry it off completely and go slow with that process. Let's go ahead and disconnect that cable from the back plate and check things out further. Taking a closer look at the bottom plate, and as I mentioned, this does hold the board for the vibration motors as well as the motors themselves. The bottom plate is plastic and a fairly flexible one at that, but does not impact the rigidity of the Win Mini overall. If you're not aware, this was originally going to be metal, but GPD made the switch to plastic, and I do think this is the right choice. Moving along, we can see the massive vent as well as grill covering part of it to prevent any dust from being drawn into the fan. All right, now we can take a look at the inside of the Win Mini without the back plate on. I'm already noticing certain components front and center, and of course, a nice close center look at the internal components of the Win Mini. My eyes are immediately drawn to the fairly sizable fan present on the Win Mini. It does appear that the analog sticks are easily accessible and removable without any need to remove additional boards or components. We have the M.2 SSD drive here, which uses the smaller 2230 form factor. And of course, the large battery in here, which is a 44.24 watt hour or 3810 milliamp hour battery. While we're at it, let's take a look at the trigger mechanism, which are Hall Effect. As I mentioned earlier, these don't have the biggest travel, but given the size of the shell, it's understandable, but these do have a smooth movement. Let's go ahead and remove this single Phillips screw holding the NVMe drive in place to just take a quick look at it. This is easily accessible, which is a good thing, except for the need to break the warranty sticker, which I find to be confusing. I do wish GBD placed this sticker elsewhere, since this should be a user serviceable component. It appears that GBD is using a Western Digital branded NVMe drive, which is nice to see. Okay, moving along, let's try to get this battery out of here and see if the cable itself is not impeded by anything else for removal. 
As is typical, the battery is held down with some very strong tape, so you will need a bit of force to get it out of the shell. So with the battery detached from the shell, I can now see the cable that was buried underneath it. We can now clearly see that the cable is buried underneath something else. This looks like a piece that is fairly easy to remove. It is held into place with three Phillips screws. One of them is actually part of the fan assembly. So let's go ahead and remove the screws to get this plastic piece out, which hopefully will give us access to the battery connection. Okay, with the screws out, the piece does come out without the need to remove the entire fan assembly. This is just a plastic piece that seems to be there more for aesthetics than anything else. But now we do have the battery connection revealed and this should just pop right off. So there you have it. That is the required process for a full battery removal. And I think it's good to know in terms of a potential need for a battery placement in the future. Now I've satisfied my curiosity here. And so I think our mini teardown has come to an end. And now it's time to get into numbers and do some synthetic benchmarking with the Wind Mini. Let's first bring up the Geekbench 6 numbers with the Win Mini at 25 watts, which scored really well in synthetic testing coming in at 10,821 for the multi-core score and 2,427 for the single core score. Now you might be wondering, why did I choose 25 watts? Well, it's actually based on the ROG Allies preset power modes with the performance option coming in at 25 watts. So of course, the next set of numbers will be the ROG Ally with the Z1 Extreme using that 25 watt performance mode and the 7040U should be very close to what we see in the Z1 Extreme, which scored 9,375 for the multi-core score and 2,223 for the single core score. Finally, I brought in my Win 4, which has the older 6800U to show the performance differences here with the Win 4 set at 25 watts, coming in at 8,378 for the multi-core score and 2,055 for the single core score. So the 7840U gives us about a 29% improvement over the 6800U on the multi-core score and about 18% on the single core score. It's important to keep in mind that the 7840U does bring some important differences to the table, such as support for the AVX512 instruction set, which will really help out for things like PlayStation 3 emulation. Let's now check out GPU numbers with 3 Mark's Time Spy, and of course, first up, let's check out the Win Mini's numbers with the 7840U set to 25 watts, and the overall Time Spy score was 2,969, a graphics score of 2,670, and finally, a CPU score of 8,148. And right up there with the 7840U is the ROG Ally and its Z1 Extreme, with a 3,076 overall Time Spy score, 2,773 for its graphics score, and finally 8,114 for its CPU score. Again, the Z1 Extreme and 7040U are very close in performance, which is expected here. Finally, the Win 4 with the 6800U set to 25 watts, and we have a Time Spy score of 2,529, a graphics score of 2,281, and a CPU score of 6,631. The 7840U is showing performance gains over the 6800U with about a 17% higher Time Spy score, about 70% higher graphics score, and finally about a 23% higher CPU score. So with the benchmarks out of the way, let's now see what the Win Mini can do in real world performance with the 7840U. For this, I decided to start out with easier to run games that can perform quite well at lower TDPs and then scale from there. This is a pretty decent way to get a sense of which way we can scale a game in terms of favoring performance or graphical fidelity. For example, Sea of Stars, which has been on screen, is the perfect example of a game that performs well at just 6 watts. And not only that, but we are well above 60 frames per second with this game. Sea of Stars is a game that doesn't have a whole lot in the way of options, but with a bit more power, we can easily lock it at 120 frames per second and make use of the Win Mini's 120Hz panel. Octopath Traveler is another game returning to the channel and is one I like to feature because of its excellent performance at lower TDPs. Here we have Octopath running at just 7 watts with a 30 frames per second cap at the native 1920 by 1080 resolution with low settings and this is a great game that scales well for all sorts of scenarios. We obviously have a lot of headroom here and so you can easily adjust settings to the way you prefer and for those battery conscious, Octopath scales down to just 7 watts and is a great one to play if you're wanting to extend battery life on the road. Here is another great lower TDP performer. Lies of P is using just 12 watts here with the game set to a 60 frames per second lock at 1920 by 1080 resolution with AMD FSR2 set to performance and low settings. Lies of P is similar to Octopath and has plenty of settings to adjust. And again, being at only 12 watts here, we once again have some room to adjust based on the scenario you are trying to target.
Next, we have the new Forza Motorsport, and just like Horizon, the Forza games have always been excellent performers on the Ryzen APUs, and here we are set to 15 watts with auto res scaling, low settings, and a 30 frames per second target. The game at these settings is performing nicely using just 15 watts, and it's a pretty impressive thing to see here with the 7040U. This is also the first time I've been able to showcase the new Forza Motorsport on the channel, and so for me it's a fun one to be able to play and share here. Let's now move on to some other great 2023 releases with the remake of Dead Space, and unsurprisingly for this one we are at 18 watts, which for me personally is the max TDP I would want to use traveling with a device like the Wind Mini. Obviously when we are docked at home, we have flexibility here to adjust the TDP higher and thus getting some room for adjusting performance. However for this footage, we are set to a 30 frames per second lock, using low settings and AMD FSR2 set to performance at the native 1920 by 1080 resolution, and at 18 watts, the Win Mini is giving us some pretty solid performance. Finally, let's check out a fairly recent new release and another one that is set to 18 watts. Alan Wake returns with its sequel Alan Wake 2, and this is one I've personally been very excited about checking out. For Alan Wake 2, we are using a 30 frames per second cap, low settings with AMD FSR2 set to balanced, and the native resolution of 1920 by 1080. Again, much of the theme here is being able to showcase gameplay at a certain power draw and given that Alan Wake 2 is a new release AAA game, with some decent requirements, it is nice to see that Alan Wake 2 can handle gaming at that 18 watts, which again is really my max target for a handheld x86 device. So with some PC gaming demonstrated here on the Wii Mini, it's now the time to check out emulation performance with the 7840U. I'm pretty excited to revisit some of these since the drivers for the 7840U have had a chance to mature a bit, and so I think we will be seeing some nice performance here with emulation. Let's start out with Wii U, which is always a highlight for an x86 handheld since it's the only way you can actually emulate Wii U and so it's always worth checking it out, despite the limited library of exclusives. Yoshi's Woolly World is always a fun one for me to showcase using the CMU emulator, and yes, we are only at 7 watts for this one, which means we have plenty of room to scale up resolution if that is your goal. For this footage, we are at the Wii U's native resolution, which looks great on the Win Mini screen. As usual, with CMU and Wii U emulation, once most of the shader compilation has completed, performance will be very smooth. And it's time to hop on over to the Xbox side and let's check out some Xbox 360 emulation with the Xenia Canary emulator. I'll start out with a slightly less demanding game and also one of my personal favorites. Elo Milo is running here at just 10 watts and does maintain its target frame rate. Elo Milo is impressive to see running at just 10 watts and I think the combination of the power on hand with the 7040U as well as recent improvements to Xenia Canary really demonstrates how far Xbox 360 emulation has come. Another game I always love playing for a quick pick up and play session is Dead or Alive 4. For Xenia Canary, you will need to make a few adjustments to the config file, which I actually cover in my massive Xenia showcase from a few months ago, and it does still apply here. However, I am really blown away that we have Dead or Alive 4 here running at 15 watts, and it is a rock solid 60 frames per second. Finally, for my last Xbox 360 game to showcase here, I have the original Forza Horizon, and like Dead or Alive 4, I have the Win Mini set to 15 watts, and performance is really solid here with Xenia Canary. The original Forza Horizon is still one of my absolute favorite racing games, and it does look beautiful on the Win Mini screen and plays great. Let's now move on over to the PlayStation side with the other 7th generation console, the PlayStation 3, using the RPCS3 emulator. I always like to start out with Dragon's Crown, which is a great example of a PS3 game that runs at a very low TDP. And here the Win Mini is set to 7 watts and Dragon's Crown is playing really smooth. This is a great looking game that definitely showcases the Win Mini's panel. And for me personally, I always love trying out the Ratchet & Clank games, and for this one we have Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction, which was the first installment of the Ratchet & Clank franchise on the PlayStation 3. For this one, we do need to bring the power up a bit to keep things nice and smooth for the most part. I believe this game does switch from 30 to 60 frames per second depending on the action on screen, so there will be occasions where we see this in gameplay. Regardless, Tools of Destruction is a really solid performer here at 18 watts. Finally, we can't showcase PlayStation 3 emulation without a bit of God of War, and in particular God of War 3, which has always been one of the more demanding games to emulate. 
for God of War 3, I am making full use of the available game patches and have disabled some demanding special effects and have locked the frame rate to 30 to keep the gameplay smooth and consistent. For God of War 3, we are set to 18 watts and the game is performing really well at that 30 frames per second lock and once most shader compilation has taken place, the game is playing without any major issues. This is pretty impressive to see for God of War 3. And I can't help but sneak in some original Xbox, which is another platform that is only available for emulation on the x86 side, and Panzer Dragoon Orta is always a personal favorite to showcase. I am using the XMU emulator for the original Xbox emulation, and at 12 watts, Panzer Dragoon Orta is doing pretty well with 2 times upscale and resolution. I do like giving this game in particular a little extra power to help keep things nice and smooth. Panzer Dragoon Orta is looking really sharp with that extra upscaling. Finally, for our last round of emulation testing, let's end with some Nintendo Switch using the Yuzu emulator. Nintendo Switch emulation in particular was pretty impressive to see given how much power we need to run a lot of the library. First up, I have the latest entry in the Pikmin series. Pikmin 4 is set to use 12 watts and the footage here is of Pikmin 4 running in handheld mode, but I did test with dock mode as well and it did run under 12 watts with some occasional dips. Regardless, Pikmin 4 looks great in handheld mode and again, I was pretty impressed with the lower power requirements. It's very obvious that Yuzu keeps improving, and mixed with the improved drivers for the 7040U, we have a nice combination here. At this point, it's almost a necessity to test some Super Mario Odyssey when discussing Switch emulation. For Mario Odyssey, I have the Win Mini set to 15 watts using handheld mode, and I'm honestly blown away by how well this is running. I ended up spending a bit more time in this one just because of how enjoyable the experience was on the Win Mini. Finally, for our last game, I went ahead and tested out a newer Mario game with Super Mario Wonder. For this game, I have the Win Mini set to just 12 watts using handheld mode, and outside of occasional dips, most likely for shader compilation, this game is performing better than I expected at just 12 watts. Mario Wonder is another game that is an absolute joy to play here on the Win Mini, and I found the controls to be accurate and responsive as one would expect for something like side-scrolling Mario. So with all of that gaming out of the way, it's time to do some battery testing and see just how long one can expect the game at certain TDP intervals. Let's start out with the worst case scenario. I am running the latest BIOS update from GPD and so I am able to take the Win Mini past 20 watts. Realistically, you should aim for that 12 to 18 watt range for more demanding gaming, and this 25 watt battery test is more to demonstrate a wide range for the battery testing. Unsurprisingly, at 25 watts, using Returnal as our test game with 50% brightness and volume, Returnal came in at a little over one hour of gameplay. In the middle, we have Returnal running at 15 watts and with 50% brightness and volume, no many many just manage under two hours of gameplay. Finally, for the last test with Returnal, we have the Win Mini set to 10 watts, and again, at 50% brightness and volume, we were able to get just about two and a half hours of gameplay. Let's now move to the lighter tests with Octopath Traveler 2 running at seven watts, using 50% brightness and volume, and we have hit about three and a half hours of gameplay. Finally, for the lightest test, here is Yoshi's Island for Super Nintendo running at 4 watts with 50% brightness and volume, and both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth disabled. In this test, we were able to get 5.5 hours of gameplay with the Win Mini. And for our last part of testing, I once again used Returnal for temperature testing and also recorded temperatures at both 18 watts versus 12 watts. This is an unusual situation as the more I use the device, I noticed that it definitely felt warm to my hands while gaming. GPD did address some of the thermal issues with a revised seashell, but interestingly, my current concerns aren't at the bottom of the shell where my fingers rest, but instead inside the shell where my thumbs rest and obviously used for gaming. For the first round of testing, I had Returnal running at 12 watts and inside the shell you can see that temperatures were getting as high as 48 degrees Celsius in certain spots. Regardless, I observed temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius all around the key gaming spots which included the analog sticks, d-pad, and face buttons compared to the keyboard area where temperatures dropped almost as much as 15 degrees Celsius. On the back, temperatures were much better, and on the spots where the rest of your hands would rest, temperatures were in the low to mid 30s range, which is very solid. The only spot that was hotter was in the center by the heatsink, which isn't as much of an issue since your hands do not directly come in contact with it. Now for my second test, I had Returnal running at 18 watts, and not much of a surprise here, but surface temperatures increased across all the key points I just mentioned, so the spots around the analog sticks, d-pad, and face buttons all recorded temperatures higher than before which were already up there. This time I recorded temperatures as high as 53 degrees Celsius and wasn't able to find any spots below 47 degrees Celsius around the key gaming areas. 
but the same as before, once I moved down to the keyboard area, temperatures dropped significantly. On the backside, it is much of the same story as before with temperatures in that low to mid 30s range and the hottest point at the center where the heatsink is. It's a bit frustrating since GPD clearly addressed the seashell issue with temperatures in a much more acceptable range, but somehow missed that temperatures get noticeably warm where the controls are for gaming. And after prolonged use for gaming, I definitely noticed those areas. So we are nearing the end of this review, and I think one question that comes to mind is who is the Win Mini for? The Win Mini is in an interesting position as it's not as useful for on-the-go productivity as something like the Win Max 2, but on the other hand, it's an incredibly compact and powerful solution. I think for fans of GPD's earlier entries in the Windows handheld space like the Win 1 and 2, the Win Mini in many ways is a dream come true. Now I am testing this 7040U model in particular, and while I think it's incredible that we have this chipset in this compact space, I do think that the heat issues are still a concern and so I am left wondering if GPD should have went with a slightly less powerful design which would have most likely brought prices down and still be a worthy upgrade from something like the Win 2 which by now has the antiquated Intel integrated graphics. It's tough because for me personally, I absolutely love this form factor and the Win Mini. I think it's a great product from GPD that blows me away every time I hold it and game on it. The level of engineering and power on hand here is truly impressive. However, the Win Mini is not going to be for everyone. But I do think that there is still an audience for this kind of device, and I hope that GPD doesn't keep us waiting years for the next entry. So what did you think about the Win Mini, and is this what you hope to see as the spiritual successor to the Win 2 from many years ago? Please let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see from the Win Mini in the future. I'm always looking for suggestions for new videos. As always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.